chemistry and physics, and I segued into biology, but I kept going with all the uh, chemistry and physics. Uh, from age eight, I decided I wanted to be a chemist, and I was reading books about chemistry and trying to burn down the house, things like that. Uh, eventually, went to Notre Dame, got a bachelor's degree in chemistry, and then went on to Caltech and got a PhD in chemical physics. Uh, there were no jobs for chemists for a while, so I started going into biology, but I'm still a chemist at heart. Okay, <laughs> so what's burning here? What is actually in the flame? A candle? Right, but this is a solid. How do you burn a solid? Melt it. Okay, but can you, one, but there's not a liquid up there in the flame, right? What is actually burning? It's the vapors. You've probably seen this trick before. So what was happening is a column of burning vapor, uh, of, of just vapor, was coming up because the radiating heat from this bright flame was heating the liquid enough to vaporize it, and it's only the vapor that's actually burning. Most things burn as gases. There are some exceptions. Some metals actually burn on the surface, and, and we'll see that a little bit later. Okay, so. What's in a candle that burns? Okay. Wax. Okay, what what is in wax that allows it to burn? I hope this thing works. Oh. No. These things always wear up. <coughs> Somebody told me to green one. This one is always easy. Hydrocarbon. Sorry? Hydrocarbon. Exactly. Okay. So that means carbon and hydrogen. And they're fairly complicated. Well, for an organic chemist, they'd say no, but for most people, they'd say it's a fairly complicated set of molecules. It's not a single kind, but it's basically a whole string of carbon atoms. Most of these are what are called normal paraffins. We call it paraffin, right? It's like propane, octane. Right. Okay. Where'd you get all this? Uh, sixth grade science. Okay. That was last year, though. Okay, so you link together all these carbon atoms and anything that isn't satisfied by bonding to carbon goes to hydrogen. Okay, so you just keep going. And these are, I forget how, how long these typically are, like 20 carbons long and so on. Now, you can combine hydrogen with oxygen to get water, and you can combine carbon with oxygen and get carbon dioxide. Or if you're unlucky, carbon monoxide, right? So what a flame is doing is breaking this apart into the carbon and the hydrogen through many, many steps. Okay, and eventually comes down to burning carbon and hydrogen. Well, it was a long history of how people figured out what was in all these compounds. But one way you can show that there's carbon in here, right? Whoa. So that's soot. So you can just keep doing that. Have fun. It really shows it well on something. Well, I picked this uh, piece of marble, first of all, because it's white and you're going to see the soot. The other thing is it has a very high capacity to absorb heat. So whatever's coming up in the flame instantly gets chilled to the, around the temperature of the marble and stops. There's no more reaction. So we can see it. The other thing, oh, cool. That's cool, let's see if this works. Can we tell that there's hydrogen? Well, if hydrogen is combining with oxygen in the air, then we expect to see water. Well, you don't see any water vapor here, right? But is that what the nitrogen? Speaking of carbon dioxide, that's what this is. This is dry ice. Dry okay. ice. It's hard to see this, but there's a little bit of frost on there. 
Yeah. yeah. It's that, well, I would get frost from the air anyway, but I'll get a lot more if I hold it over the candle flame because what I have is a stream of burned gases and includes a lot of water vapor. Water vapor isn't going to condense because it's warm enough and mixes into the air. Okay? So, uh, so it's, this candle is burning in the air, and the part that lets it burn is the oxygen. Okay? Because um, if you look at the energy change in combining hydrogen with oxygen instead of with carbon, it's a big change. In fact, it's going downhill in energy, which is the way things go. All right? Uh, you can't do that with nitrogen. You can't. You can. You might say you can burn hydrogen with nitrogen to make ammonia. In fact, that's how you burn fertilizer, right? Uh, it's not burning. You have to use intense heat and pressure. Take hydrogen and nitrogen from the air and make ammonia. Um, that's the reason that one third of the people in the world are alive today. They are supported by the Haber-Bosch process that makes nitrogenous fertilizers that allows crops to grow as much as they do. So, uh, you can figure out what else that implies. All right, so, let's see if, uh, a glass jar, I need a way to get it down there. enough air circulation engendered by the heat of the flame, right? It's rising up this way and it's sucking in air around the sides. Okay, but what if we put the product of combustion in there? What if we put carbon dioxide in there? And I'm going to do that by adding dry ice. It's going to take it a little while to Okay, so there's a general chemical principle that the uh, products of a reaction inhibit the reaction itself from going forward. So carbon dioxide being the end product is not able to support further combustion. What if we go the opposite way? Can I make it higher in oxygen? Sure. All right. Let's get this thing started again. How can I make oxygen easily? Have you ever seen the uh, air liquide trucks going by in town? It's a French company now. And what they sell is liquefied gases like nitrogen and oxygen in these big trucks. Okay. And Liquid oxygen is a favorite product. It's used medically and other ways. And they make it with special refrigeration units that eventually get air cold enough to condense into liquids. Okay, And then they distill it just like you would distill water and alcohol or anything else like that. Okay, That's not the way I'm going to make it. Good old hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is basically water with some extra oxygen stuck in it. You could use it as mouthwash, right? Right, and that's why it's effective, because it liberates free oxygen that tends to kill bacteria. Okay, so ordinary water doesn't have this extra oxygen in here. And it's unstable. I mean, compared to breaking up into water and oxygen, it, it shouldn't be stable. And in fact, 
It isn't. Um, some of the uh, rocket flights have been fueled with 90% hydrogen peroxide and then a combustible hydrocarbon like kerosene. Okay. You don't want to be anywhere near 90% hydrogen peroxide because it's explosive unless it's handled very, very well. This is 3%. It still breaks up slowly over time, and that's why they have, I don't know if they list it on here. No, they don't. There's, there's a stabilizer, and I'm trying to remember what it is. But I can make this oxygen come out of here. All right. By taking part of an old battery. My other one doesn't work, I've got this one. <coughs> oh yeah. If you ever take apart an ordinary alkaline dry cell, uh, they used to have a carbon electrode down the center, basically graphite. And now they don't, they have a carbon paste. But the rest of the gunk in here is mostly things like manganese dioxide. And that's useful for generating a reaction that uh, generates an electric current, but that's not what I'm going to use it for. It's also a catalyst that will break apart hydrogen peroxide. So I just keep pushing this around. All right. Okay, so I just liberated a whole bunch of oxygen. What's going to happen to the flame when I put the candle in there? It's going to get livelier. Mm, yay! Burns a lot brighter. Okay, so the reaction goes faster because you've got more concentration of the reactants in there. Yeah. It's like when you um, power, it's like when you take a whole bunch of powder and alpha salts and then you put it in hot water. Right, and temperature is a separate effect. You've got the concentration of reactants and then also the temperature, which tends to, higher temperature tends to promote uh, faster reactions. Okay. Ah, okay. So everybody's familiar with candles, right? Uh, but wait. David, you said that you were in the Army or what? Mm. Yeah. Um, did you ever see a magnesium fire? Magnesium fire? Right, because, well, yeah, you're, not you're, not, you're not old enough, I don't not think, for the Army. World War II. Um, Saw it out at the missile range. Did you? Okay. There were cases, they used to build fighter planes from magnesium alloy. And sometimes when they were coming back from a mission, they blew their tires and they would skid across the deck of the aircraft carrier and it got the metal hot enough to catch on fire. And when magnesium catches on fire, there's nothing you can do. They would push the plane off the edge. With the pilot, say, you get on on your own, because <laughs> the only thing it will do is burn the whole ship. Okay, so, somewhere. Ah. Now, let me caution you. Don't look at this uh, very long in any one position in your eye because it puts out intense ultraviolet light. In fact, magnesium flares are used in uh, military operations. And I'm going to drop this into something so that it doesn't hold on to it. Okay, well, actually, let's pass this around. This is metal. It's slightly oxidized, it's not bright like fresh yeah, magnesium. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll pass it. So, you, you saw this thing on the previous slide. David, you've handled, have you handled magnesium ribbon? <laughs> Okay, 
you got to get metals fairly hot. That's why I'm using this. I can actually light it from a candle flame, but it takes forever. So, metals can burn if you get them hot enough. Okay, I've got a piece of aluminum. It's just going to burn. It's very similar in its chemistry to magnesium. But I got a big bunch here, right? I'm going to so that I don't have to hold my hand in. I don't think we're getting anywhere. It's red hot. The tip, yeah, I can see it. But a flame isn't starting. And you're getting a little bit of some flex off of there. Okay. But it's not burning because a bulk metal is really hard to get hot enough so that it vaporizes and burns. And the reason is this conducts heat really well. So it's coming down toward me. All right. If I make it thin, it will burn. It won't give a flame, uh, not in air. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow, this is cool. Is that dry ice? Yeah, it's dry ice. Okay. So ordinary aluminum foil, right? It's aluminum oxide. Pretty flaky stuff. It's not hot because it's so thin it cools off very quickly. If I waited uh, long enough, uh, if I had enough oxygen, I could make that burn. I could even make a bigger piece of aluminum burn. Um, so I made oxygen, and I let that support the burning of the candle. There's another thing, and I want to do it only for a short time. Um, how about chlorine? Oh, you can just uh, put it up on the table and I'll throw it away. Okay. So, there's chlorine in bleach, right? You know the smell of chlorine, right? It smells good. Smells good? <laughs> So this is also unstable for releasing either chlorine eh, or oxygen because the formula for this stuff, sodium, which stays there as an ion, hypochloride. And depending upon what conditions you put it under, you can either get the oxygen out of there and you've got sodium chloride, table salt. Or you can leave the oxygen there and bring in a hydrogen and make an alkali and you can split off the chlorine. And that's what I'm going to do. How do I do that? Here's something else that is chlorine. Has anybody seen this? Muriatic acid. People use it for etching concrete and so on. It is hydrochloric acid. I'm going to have to move this stuff out of here after I start it. Uh, and I'm going to put a cover on this. This is nasty stuff. Okay. Okay. Chlorine is cold. 
chlorine going to color. Fortunately, hydrochloric acid is actually pretty wimpy compared to nitric and sulfuric and other strong acids. All right. Chlorine is called that because of the color green. Chloros means green, green. Okay. Will it support combustion? Makes a weird kind of a flame. Okay. Oh, I remember something. If you can get the candle but not pour it on the candle, it'll go out. Yeah, well... Chlorine supports combustion, not very well for things that contain carbon. <laughs> but it certainly burns well to make the, uh, You've heard of Freon refrigerants, right? Mm -hmm. And the original Freons, which are dichloro, difluoro, methane, have been banned because they, they break up in the air, especially in the stratosphere, to make what's called chlorine radicals. And those catalytically destroy ozone. Okay, so breaks up in ozone, it makes two products that then also can break up ozone. So it looked like this. It's actually a, a three-dimensional structure. So that the advantages of freons were that they were very, very stable until you get up in the sunlight in the stratosphere and it takes years, uh, which means that they weren't toxic to people. Does anybody know what refrigerants were used back before the freons? They're still used in some places. Ammonia. Ammonia. Yeah, ammonia is a good refrigerant, but uh, when ammonia leaks, it's lethal very quickly. Uh, so this was a good replacement. Is it going to be good for putting out fires? In fact, well, I've got a, a fire extinguisher here, for good reason, right? And uh, I don't think it says on here what is in here. It's dry chemical, which means that it's safe for electrical fires and other things. It probably is a freon propellant with a dry phosphate compound in it. Can I fill this with Freon? Yeah, maybe. Why does it stay down there? If I do. It's heavier. It's heavier, yeah. It's a lot denser. Okay. Um, I'm not sure which. This is actually a chlorofluoro hydrocarbon. So at least one of these is a hydrogen, which makes it much easier to break up in the lower atmosphere very quickly so it doesn't get all the way up to the stratosphere and cause problems. Okay, but even if I do this, does anybody know about atomic weights of individual atoms? Okay. Do you know what fluorine is? Okay, 19. This is 34 and a half. How do you get a half? Because this should be the number of protons and neutrons, roughly, in the nucleus. It's because there's not just one form of chlorine. There's two stable isotopes. Okay. Uh, okay, carbon let's assume this is a hydrogen. Wait, carbon is 12.011? Okay, so we'll round it off to the nearest. 
Yeah. Also because that's all I remember right now. And they've also <laughs> changed the basis of the atomic weights a couple of times. Okay, so let's add these up. What's two thirty-four and a half? Sixty-nine. Sixty-nine plus nineteen. And twelve. And one. Hundred and one. Okay, so the uh, formula weight for this is 101. And what's nitrogen in there? Mm. Remember the atomic weight of nitrogen? 14. Like double three. So that's 28. And then we've got some oxygen. Oops. Each one of these is 16, so that's 32. So this is a whole lot heavier than air. And one principle about gases and at these temperatures and pressures, all these things act pretty much like ideal gases. And that means that uh, the number of molecules in a given volume is the same no matter what you have. So if you have more of this in a volume, it's heavier than air. Okay, so. So I'm going to fill this with Freon. Don't have hydrogen in them. Uh, you feel it? Sorry. Yeah, please. We feel it, it's moving this way, right? Okay. No, the some films. Oh, okay. Oh, here, here's a uh, fan. So true. Uh, anyway. uh, let's go back to the magnesium. Magnesium was burning in air very nicely, okay? Do you think magnesium will burn in carbon dioxide? small flames, so uh, you're, you're right there. Okay, so we've got carbon dioxide coming here, all right? And that's also heavier than air, so that's going to stay in there. All right. sure we get enough um, carbon dioxide in there. We need some water. Now, where, do we have a pitcher of water? The old classic thing, right? You pour water on, car on dry ice. Oh, okay. Let's do some things about carbon dioxide. How much carbon dioxide is there in the air right now? A linear molecule. I don't know if you've heard the, uh, the reports. I don't think it gets much on ordinary TV. When I was born, the old when I was a boy story, right? It was 300 parts per million. 
So 300 molecules out of a million in the atmosphere were carbon dioxide. I just said 350 parts per million. It's up to 390 now. Oh, really? You're yeah. Right. And it's rising right now about two parts per million every year. And that's mostly from us burning fossil fuels and deforesting things, okay? And that goes to changing the climate, okay? But what was it in the past? Was it higher or lower? If you, let's go back to the ice ages. What was it back then? It was a lot higher. In the ice ages, it was actually low. Say, there was 180 parts per million the depth of the ice age, and that's one of the reasons it was so cold, because the, the, the greenhouse effect was really diminished. After the ice age has ended, but before people became really active burning things, it was 280. Okay. How do we know that? Core that samples? Core samples from ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. Okay. Now, these go back about 400,000 years. And the climate has been sort of waffling between these two values for all that time. But in the past, it was a lot higher. Okay, When the dinosaurs were around, well, the estimates might have been about 2,500 parts per million. Did that make it toasty? The answer is yeah. yeah. Uh, what they have inferred from lots of chemical analyses about how temperature affects the way coral forms and all this stuff in shells is that the average surface temperature of the ocean was about 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's body temperature, right? What is the average surface temperature of the ocean now? Um, it varies depending on where you are, but it's around 20 degrees. So it's a lot hotter. In fact, um, What's this guy's name? I'm trying to remember the guy at Penn State who studied all this, and he called the time of the Cretaceous the Saurian sauna because it was incredibly warm. Um, having this carbon dioxide around is handy because it does keep our planet a lot warmer. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, which is mostly driven by carbon dioxide, but expressed mostly by the water vapor that makes the air uh, entrain. Uh, we would be, well, oops, let me back up. What's the average temperature of the Earth surface? Anybody know? It gets cold in the winter, it gets warm in the summer, we've got different hemispheres, so you average it all out. And it just happens to be the average temperature of Las Cruces, day and night, year-round, 15 degrees Celsius, which is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, but if you take the amount of sunlight that the Earth absorbs, and you figure, in balance, it's all going to be radiated back out, and in fact, that's what you see from space. If you go up in a spacecraft, you see the average radiative temperature of the Earth, not at the surface, but above it, minus 18 degrees Celsius, which is approximately zero degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So the, the uh, greenhouse effect warms the surface of the Earth, it doesn't change the overall balance of the Earth viewed from outside. Okay. Um, this had been higher in the past, as I said. But when the Earth started out, uh, it was all solidified. We didn't have carbon dioxide there. We had methane. Methane is, is a really potent greenhouse gas. It's 22 times stronger per molecule than carbon dioxide at current conditions. That's one reason you worry about gas leaks. Well, not in your home. Uh, but you worry about gas leaks, particularly in Russia where they're pretty sloppy about their practices. They put a lot of methane into the air. Okay. Anyway, that's methane was useful to warm the earth when the earth first solidified and actually 
say, at about 3.8 billion years ago, when the first bacteria were around, the sun was only 70% as intense as it is now. So unless the methane were there, it would have frozen solid and stayed frozen solid. Okay? So then, what happened to all the methane? It became carbon dioxide. How did that happen? It's our friends, the bacteria. Cyanobacteria. They were the first to develop a form of photosynthesis that put out oxygen, just like we're used to from green plants. And all of their mechanisms were built into green plants later. Long process of evolution. They created free oxygen, which actually oxidized all the methane over some millions of years to carbon dioxide. Oh, then we had a pretty weak greenhouse effect. Then what happened? The Earth did freeze over. In, in fact, there's all sorts of evidence of snowball Earth occurring at least three times, where the Earth, it's possible that it froze all the way to the equator, glaciers covering the entire Earth, and the only thing that brought us out of that snowball earth was volcanoes slowly pumping in more and more carbon dioxide. It took about 50 million years until there was so much carbon dioxide that there was a good greenhouse effect that melted all the ice. And then what happened? Then the oceans went up to 50 degrees Celsius. Only bacteria survived that, and just barely. So anyways. An interesting story, and what I want to go to is uh, carbon dioxide. All right, let me turn this up so it go away. All, uh, so let's see the water. You see? Oh, here we are. Great. Yeah, we're going to see this one, right? Party trip. That's not carbon dioxide you're seeing, that's water vapor frozen, okay? But now we're going to see if we can get this magnesium ribbon put out by putting it in. dioxide does not put out a magnesium fire. That's one reason that magnesium fires are so dangerous. Anybody who's machining magnesium and getting these little flakes and, and turnings all over, the only thing you can put out is the sand. And that's fairly slow because what magnesium is doing, okay, Magnesium oxide is the form that you get when you burn magnesium in air. Magnesium is perfectly happy to combine with carbon to make magnesium carbide. And so carbon, oxygen, hey, I'm happy burning in either one of those. So it did not put this out. All right. metal that burns. That's a metal? Yeah. Well, see this, right? No more. Yeah, okay. Can I see it? There you go. Temperature dry ice anyway, anybody know? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, just do it down. Yeah. Oh, okay.
it's colder than ordinary ice, right? Right. So, why can I hold it like this? I'm not really holding it, right? <laughs> You're tossing it. I'm tossing it because, well, one thing that keeps me from getting really burnt, and that is a frostbite burn, is that it gives off so much gas when I heat it that it makes a little insulating layer. <laughs> but you can't do it too long. Because if you do grab it, you'll get frostbite very quickly. So how cold is it? It's minus 58 degrees Celsius, which is about like minus 70 something Fahrenheit. Okay. All right, so actually what I wanted to continue doing is getting all the carbon dioxide out of this. I want to make some more oxygen. And remember, oh, what should I use? Remember? What did I make the oxygen with last time? Wasn't it like a battery or something? Yeah, battery was the catalyst. Peroxide. Peroxide, yeah. So, I'm going to get some hydrogen peroxide in here. And where's my little battery? Okay. This is running out of stuff. Oh, a catalyst, by the way, is something that accelerates a chemical reaction without ultimately being changed itself. So, like the enzymes in your body are catalysts. They don't get used up. Okay. So you're using the inside of a battery? Right, a, an ordinary alkaline battery. So what's in that? Manganese dioxide. And that's the, the catalyst. Okay. So first of all, ah, put this on here so I don't burn myself. I can burn steel wool, right? Well, okay, so that's sort of burning. So, uh, sparklers that are used for the 4th of July are actually mostly iron flakes or iron powder with an oxidizer that provides that oxygen uh, very densely right around those particles. So they'll burn like, so the uh, iron will burn like this, okay? I already did the chlorine, I don't think I'll do that again. Okay, so I mentioned the, the, the sparklers where the oxygen is built into some of the other chemicals that are put in there with the iron uh, dust, okay? But there's another way that I can get oxygen and other things put in with combustibles. This is flash paper that I made uh, yesterday, okay? What's flash paper? Well, <laughs> made out of this stuff. Anything that burns readily? Okay, well, paper will burn readily, right? right. Okay, uh, we can all see that. I can take this. So we're used to seeing flames like that, okay? What if I take part of the compounds that are in paper and add something that's full of oxygen, okay? So basically, uh, there's all these, these links with glucose molecules to make cellulose, that's paper, right? It's also the, probably the compound that's most common on Earth be, uh, from living materials. And there's hydroxyl groups floating off of here. These are ordinary sugars, glucose, the first product of photosynthesis that we're familiar with. I'm going to actually replace that with nitro groups. Okay? So now instead of hydrogen, I've got two things, two oxygens, and the nitrogen by itself is, is pretty good for um, leaving, you know, giving off energy when it combines with itself to make ordinary N2, nitrogen gas. So, what I did is I soaked, a, well, a 
whole bunch of pieces of this in uh, a mixture of what's called mixed acids. Oh, those are interesting too, okay? Mixed acids are sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Okay? So you mix these two together. Nitric acid, that's the formula for nitric acid. You've got two of these. And sulfuric acid is so strong that it actually uses the nitric acid as a base, as if it's something that can neutralize an acid. And it gives you this nitronium ion and other products and so on. Uh, how strong is sulfuric acid? Okay, you're familiar with the scale of acidity. pH 7 is neutral, okay? And as you go lower, you get more and more acidic. So stomach acid is pH 2, typically. It's inter interesting how it gets made uh, in your body. We don't eat anything that acidic, okay? And that's a, that's a whole other story. But, you don't eat lemons? Um, lemons are, are pH 2, but you don't eat lemons all day, right? Even if you don't eat lemons, you can make stomach acid. Okay, but that's a good point. All right, so that's about the thing we're most use, uh, used to. Okay, um, I've got hydrochloric acid. That was the one I used. You uh, could eat lemons all day. It'd just be really weird. Yeah, you know what happened? The dentist would love you because you wouldn't have any teeth. <laughs> okay, here's hydrochloric acid. Concentrated like this, it's, I don't know, like pH minus 2 or something. Okay, you can go negative. Sulfuric acid concentrated is minus 13, which means that it's approximately 10 trillion times more potent as an acid. It's, it's as if it had 10 trillion times more protons running around than others. It's a fact of what's called chemical potential. It doesn't mean you really have 10 trillion protons. You can't. Uh, but it's an extremely strong acid. Um, that's why it's one of the most dangerous acids. It's also the industrial chemical made in the greatest quantity. Who uses sulfuric acid? Everybody. Pickling steel, uh, synthesizing lots of chemicals, including uh, a lot of refining of hydrocarbons from oil. Okay. All right. Um, I want a volunteer who will okay, put that in and put that in that plant. Again? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> just like disintegrated. Wow. <laughs> who else wants it? Just drop it on the table before it burns you. Just drop it on the ground, actually. It, it probably won't hurt the table. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, just Get it started. <laughs> Why does wow, this thing burn so fast when ordinary paper doesn't, right? So I've got ordinary paper. Yeah, it's fast, but it's not that fast. And it, you know. The reason is because I put all the oxygen supply into the paper by making uh, nitrocellulose. And they used to use nitrocellulose in a lot of things. They used it as a replacement for ivory when uh, they were trying to um, cut back on the destruction of the elephant population. You can actually dissolve this in ether, and you can form it into things, piano keys, one thing. The other thing was billiard balls. Ooh. Like an intensely flammable piano? I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The more interesting problem was when they made billiard balls, okay, this stuff will spontaneously ignite when you get it about as hot as a hot iron. But it will also, if you have some, you know, little impurities, it will explode. And explode. Not in big quantities, but they had billiard balls that would explode. Somebody would you know, make a good shot, nice hard hit. Bam! <laughs> so they went to different materials. 
Anyway, this is fun if anybody wants to try this. I want to do it again. What happens if we throw like four in there? <laughs> well, let's see. Here, let me. If anybody wants these, I've got. Anybody want one? Yeah. Can we use it right now or not? Well, why don't you save it? You can do it at home. I'm impressed with you. Anybody else? No take I would like another Like, if well, anyone, if anyone else doesn't want one, if okay. anyone else doesn't want one, I'll take theirs. Oh, cool. Okay. You notice it feels a lot uh, stiffer you put in the oven. than the original. Oh. <laughs> okay. We can make some fresh. Um, I have to actually get the cover from this other. You want to burn it? Want to burn it? No. If you want to, What's left? there's a candle there. Yeah. Oh, um, it's basically table salt. Yeah. Water. Okay. Can I burn this right now? If you want. <laughs> okay. That is magic. It's magic. <laughs> well, okay. After the chlorine stuff, how many people are willing to, right, to put up with a little more smell? What? Okay, because if I use the mixed acids, this it gives off some vapors, uh, and, a, and I can cover it, but it will still be giving them off. It's just stinky. It's okay. <laughs> make our well, water make us sneeze. <laughs> um, in long exposures, it becomes harmful. Yeah. So, I did it in the kitchen with the vent going. So, let's go for it. Go for it. Okay. So, here's a lesson about acids. Okay. <laughs> Nitric acid, as it comes here, is um, you might say it has a high water content. What happens if you put water into a strong acid? Well, when you mix water with any acid, you get, it gets warm. Uh, and when you mix water with sulfuric acid, it gets very warm. In fact, um, if you say you have a, a beaker full of acid, and you put in some water, it will actually vaporize into steam and splatter the acid out. And every chemist has done this at least once. Okay? And you hope only once. So what do you do? You add acid to water so that the amount of heat being liberated is, is controlled in a large volume of water that can absorb that heat. Nitric acid itself is pretty, pretty smelly. But you can see what it did to the cap over the years. Just ate up the plastic. So that's your acid first already? This is the nitric acid, which is a lot, it's, it's actually acting more like the water. It has mostly water. And here's the sulfuric acid. Oh, um, if you're willing to look at it, a little bit, when I pour it in, you can see all of these little swirls in there. That's the, that's the warm water. I should measure it two to one. So, now, oh, um, could you hand me the scissors, please? Okay. Well, actually, here. somebody cut me a piece. About as big as will fit in there from here. So it's got to be pretty small. Okay, it should be 
about, actually about the size, it should be about this size. Uh, that's that's kind of small. Let's let's cut it about like that. We can do two at a time. Okay. So I'll open it. You throw it right in the center. And oh, does somebody have a watch? It should go for five minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Make sure you don't touch that stuff. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty awful. It smells good. <laughs> okay, and I'll stir it once in a while. The other thing I have to do to get ready is to have ordinary water to wash it because if I don't the sulfuric acid keeps working on it and tries to turn it into jelly and I need something safe to pull it out of there um, somewhere I had two plastic ah here we are <laughs> You can tell when it's right because if you pick it up early, it's just soggy and it rips. But if you let it go for five minutes, it becomes kind of tough, plastic-like. Okay. Okay. Now we can go on to a, another thing while that's happening, and that is it looks kind of Japan too. Flashpoint. Okay. What is the flashpoint of a material? That candle. Oh, that candle is dripping on the floor. What's all about wax? Yeah. Yep. Look at all that wax. Can we touch it? Not so much. Let me point this one in. Okay. So this is a nice convenient thing called a stirring hot plate. Because besides having a heating element, it also has a little stir bar. That's the thing that gets ever so hot. And I'm not actually going to use it for this. What I want it for is to heat something up. It's really hot, too. It's taking over my fingers. So, it's hot. things that are More flammable tend to be more liquid, right? You know what acetone is? Where you finally commonly find it? Nail polish. Nail polish remover. Okay. It's pretty free flowing liquid, right? going to catch fire. Uh, no? Yeah. Let's see. Okay, let's, let's survey. Let's have some bets. How many people say yes? Okay. All right. You can tell it vaporizes really well. You instantly get that acetone odor. Whoa, yeah. I had some ordinary alcohol, ethanol, but I couldn't find it. How about methanol? Wood alcohol. Why is it called wood alcohol? Because it used to be made by distilling wood, you can actually distill stuff out of wood, okay. You can, you can smell methanol. It's pretty volatile. Okay. Use a 
fire extinguisher once, you can never use it again. another alcohol. You probably don't run into this one. Butanol. Is this all oh no. Well, people have drunk uh, methanol when they were desperate, you know, like in prohibition and so on, and they went blind. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, let's take this out. Nothing, because it's wet. One of the reasons the that... The will go out? Yeah. Well, I don't know. If it depends on where you drop it on the candle. But water is a really good fire extinguisher. Water? Because... Yeah. It takes out all the alcohol and then it takes out all the Right. And the other thing is, it absorbs a tremendous amount of heat when it vaporizes, and that tends to cool down the fire. So it's not useful in only a, a very few fires, like, again, magnesium fires. Now, this is going to take a while to dry. Uh, okay, anyway, we'll do the butanol. So it smells vaguely like an alcohol. I'm going to take a quick sniff. Are you sure you did that? Okay. Well, what? We're not at its flash button. We have to heat it up. And... How can I tell how hot the liquid is? A couple of ways. This thing is called a thermocouple thermometer. Hot plate. Hot plate, okay. What I can do is stick this wire in here. Oh, how do I do that? I want a way to uh, hold this stuff, hold this. Uh, Thermocouple in the liquid, and we'll find out how hot it was when it burned. Okay, so I don't know if you want it in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Okay. Too. Okay. 
was like 120. Okay. Not a very accurate measurement, but it indicates that when you heat up something like this, you can make enough vapors appear in this airspace that it can ignite. You have to have a certain number of molecules.